thank you, folks. Good to have you all this morning. If you have your Bible, turn to Philippians 2 with me, please. Father, I pray for your presence, Lord. We need you. We need you. We need you here. We need the unction, the anointing, liberty and freedom, the Holy Spirit. In thy name we pray, amen. Okay, now, I've uh, said before, and uh, many times, something that I've learned down through the years, uh, God is not impressed with your intellect, all right? You're not smart in the sight of God. <laughs> amen. <laughs> he knows all things. That almighty being is, uh, you know, why would a man be so foolish to compare himself with the Lord when it comes to that? I mean, that's the utter, that's utter uh, foolishness. So God's not impressed with your intellect. He's not impressed with your achievements. You may be the greatest thing in your religion. You may have, you may have awards <laughs> dragging the ground. You may be the most wonderful thing in your church. He's not impressed with that. He's no respecter of persons. He's not impressed with your achievement. He's not impressed with your intellect. He's not impressed with your associations and who you know and how, you know, how, how, how well you're respected in the community and how high you are in the rank and file. Um, but one thing that does move the heart of God, and it moves his heart, and that's a humble spirit, a humble and a contrite spirit, that does move him. And it makes a difference with God when someone comes to him and uh, doesn't plead their abilities or their accomplishments or their intellect, or, but they simply come, as Charlotte Elliott said, uh, just as I am. The thinking in the mind is so important. Uh, I've known some men down through the years, written some good commentaries. I've got their commentaries. Brilliant men. I mean brilliant. I'm talking about smart men. But uh, many of these men had hang-ups. They had... Uh, they had a problem, and, uh, and we all have to deal with that. And what is that? It's pride, folks. It's pride. It's a problem of pride. And uh, I've had them even say at times, so, you know, I just wish that wasn't in the Bible. <laughs> they believe the Bible, but they wish it weren't in there. The Bible says over here, to let this mind be in you. Verse number 5, Philippians 2. The way you think, your attitude. Uh, have you ever heard the term... Uh, that person's got an attitude. <laughs> sure you have. You've heard that. And uh, that's one of the first things that they deal with when you go to military. You go to Paris Island, South Carolina, they'll deal with your attitude. <laughs> They've got you, and they're going to keep you. And uh, they're going to deal with your attitude. Uh, when you're there firsthand, you can understand what I'm talking about. You can see it. You can see men. You can see men that you never thought would break, break. You can see them break. It's quite, a, it's quite an experience to watch that happen. I'm talking about big, strong men. Break. It's not the physical part that got them. It's the mental. It's that constant, unrelenting, mental assault from the moment you set foot on that uh, island until you leave there. I mean, they're in your face day in and day out. So what you do, you toughen your mind. Your mind gets tough. You, you learn to, to you, you say to yourself, well, now I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. Well, now, folks, that's, that has a lot to do with the Christian life. Life gets hard. And Satan can come at you with, uh, he doesn't play fair. <laughs> Satan doesn't fight fair. Oh, no, 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 no. If you think you're going to get fairness out of this world, you live in, you're, you're naive. Satan does not fight fair, and uh, we're not ignorant of his devices. I've watched Christians on their way down as their Christian life begins to fall apart around them, and the people you thought would come to their aid and be a friend to them and help them and uh, bear them up, run. And I've noticed sometimes when Christians start going down, they start falling and things start coming apart, there's always that crowd that begins to judge them. They've always got a reason for everything. Well, this wouldn't be happening unless you've done such and so, or God's dealing with something in your life, or this or that, and so forth. That was Job's three friends over there in the book of Job. They all had the answer. None of them had the answer. 
They wore Job out. God told him at the end of the book of Job, he said, you haven't spoken according to my, my word. You don't know what you're talking about, in other words. Uh, Elihu was the only one who showed up in the book of Job who, who really understood what was going on. He understood the higher principle and purpose and what it was about. So you learn how to think. You have to understand God wants you to think. He wants, and the first thing he has to do is reduce you down to where you realize that he's no respecter of persons. No respecter of persons. We do. We make Christian celebrities, Christian heroes. I remember when, well, the church I got saved in uh, was entirely different from the church that I, that I later went to. I had never been in a church that worshipped men. But boy, I got in one one time. And I'll tell you what, it was quite an experience. All I heard from the time I got into that church were these great men. Great men, great men, great. And I thought to myself, well, where were they when I got saved? Never heard of these great men. <laughs> but anyway, you know, that's, that's sad. Look over here in Matthew chapter 33, 13, rather, verse number 55. Matthew 13, 55. When our Lord Jesus Christ started in this world, he started... Just as plain and simple as you possibly could. Is not this the carpenter's son? See, he wasn't the, king, the son of a king. He was the carpenter's son. There's something about Christ that makes him entirely different from anyone else. Everything about his holiness and his righteousness and all of that, folks, he earned while he was here. Innate to his character as the second person of the Godhead, Yes, but he earned it. He earned it. And he established a righteousness on this earth that did not exist before he showed up. Now, I've said that time and time and time again, but think about what I just said to you. None of the Old Testament saints, not a one of them, knew the righteousness of the Son of God because that righteousness had never come into being yet. It was when he lived a sinless, perfect life that a righteousness was established for a man that had never existed. And that righteousness that was established for a man that never existed is what God gives you. For he has made into us righteousness. So he started as a carpenter's son. Matthew chapter number 8 and verse number 20. Matthew eight twenty. Jesus saith unto him, The foxes have holes... And the birds of the air have nest, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. It means that he was, uh, what was he? He, wasn't, he was not a beggar, and he was not a street person. No, sir, he was not that. He would work. He was the carpenter's son, but he's talking about the station of his life. He chose not to have anything. In other words, he chose to live by faith day by day. <clears throat> that was that was his that was his uh, that was his choice. Uh, that's not an easy choice to make. I remember someone came through here years ago, and they told my wife. I used to be a professional mechanic. I've got tools that I've had for almost fifty years now. It cost me an arm and a leg if I had to buy them again. And they told my they told my wife said, he needs to he needs to get rid of all of his tools and live by faith. I thought to myself, you might as well pull my leg off and get rid of my tools. <laughs> Those are my tools. <laughs> That's exactly right. And I've used them time and time and time, and something tears up, I fix it. You know, and I need my tools. That's not, an, I, that's not a proof that you're living by faith. No, that's not a proof you're living by faith. Living by faith is an entirely different situation. It's when you put your life into the hands of God and then you, why lie here, why you lie you here idle? He said to them, get up and go get a job, go to work. And see to it that God will feed you, clothe you, put food on your table, take care of you, supply your needs. That's living by faith. Down through the years, I've known uh, here at Temple, I mean, when you've been somewhere <laughs> for 42 years, you see about everything. We've had some swamis come through. So what's a swami? <laughs> 
It's some fellow who thinks that God's put a specific calling on his life, even though he's got a wife and children, and he no longer works, but he just goes about and spiritually ministers to people. Well, how does he pay his bills? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> because when it comes to bill paying time, you know, he's between a rock and a hard place. But I've had them say to me, well, now, preacher, we just don't have enough time. And I need to get out here, and I need to minister, and I need to get the word out, and I need to do this, and I need to do that. And I know it wasn't, it was a long time ago, this one man had that attitude, and it wound up busting his home up. His wife got enough of it, got tired of it, and she left him. And she left him because he wouldn't pay his bills, you see. Well, when God called you to preach, or he called you to the mission field, or he called you as a minister, or whatever he called you to do, it doesn't mean you don't work anymore. Did you know the Apostle Paul was a tent maker? He did. He was a tent maker. And work is not a curse, folks. Work is not a curse. It's a blessing to be able to get up and go to work. There's, no, there's nothing. And the most honorable thing in the world you can do is to, is to go to work. Uh, there are times when you can't work. If something physically happens to you. We all understand that. We help people. We don't give them a hand out. We give them a hand up. We try to pull them back up and get them reestablished. There's, that's good. There's nothing. That's the good thing. That's what we ought to do. And, uh, but uh, he had nowhere to lay his head. John 1, 46. They said this about where he came from. John 1, 46. All the things that people hold of value, he disdained. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. He was not born on the right side of the tracks. He was born on the wrong side of the tracks. See? His place of birth, his station in life, the things that people count so, uh, they put so much stock in. God meant, and he meant to come into this world. Look at where he was born in a stable a manger, that's a feed animals from a manger, to start low. Matthew chapter number, uh, Isaiah 53 and verse number 2. Here's what it said about his appearance. Isaiah 53 verse 2. He is despised and, re and, and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. See that? Look at verse 2. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. If you feel a fleshly drawing toward the Son of God, you're hold of a religious demon. There should be nothing about your flesh that desires the Lord Jesus Christ in any way whatsoever. It should be spiritual. That's why the Son of Man came. In plain of words, there was nothing. He was not beautiful. You know the beautiful man in the Old Testament? You know who the most beautiful one was? That's exactly right. Abba Shalom. Son of peace. Abba. Abba. Father. Father. Abba. Shalom, Abbasalam, that's his name. Father of peace, had long flowing locks. Oh, the women loved him. He was beautiful. And what did his beauty do for him? Got him in trouble, boy. Hung up in an oak tree. <laughs> Those long locks. That's right. But, uh, you know, that's, the point is, is simply this. The Lord Jesus Christ is not, did not come into this world to draw us because of his beauty, the physical beauty. There's a beauty of holiness that draws us. But that's not on the outside. Matthew chapter number 11 and verse number 19. Matthew eleven nineteen. 19. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of her children. Look how they accused him. They literally call him a drunkard, a wine bibber. That's what that term means. He was a drunkard. They call him a drunkard. Why? To denigrate him, to demonize him, 
to drag him down. So once you've demonized someone, drugged them down, then you can do away with them. It becomes socially acceptable to do away with them. Have you noticed how that Christianity in this nation is being drugged down? Have you noticed how it's always cast in a bad light and Islam is always pumped up? Yeah, Islam is pumped up, Christ is pushed down. I mean, you, can't, you have to be blind not to see that. So they accused him. They're beginning to lay the foundation for the cross. A wine bibber, they called him. Luke chapter number 8 and verse number 3. Luke 8, 3. And Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others, which ministered unto him of their substance, of their goods. It's not that he begged, it's that they wanted to give. <coughs> You'll never find him begging for anything. Amen. Pray, Father, give us this day our what? Daily bread. And God took care of him. But they minister him, to him of their substance. I know some folks that won't let you help them. Folks, things happen to people. You lose your job. You get sick. You get hurt. You can't work. Uh, they cancel your insurance policy. You know, stuff like that happens to people. You're in a car wreck. Uh, you know, all kinds of things can happen. can happen so quickly. And you need help. That's when God's people should come together and help you. They should help you. And God will bless them for blessing you. That's the way it ought to be. And that's the way it should be. And, um, and uh, they gave, they gave of, to him of their substance. Look at John chapter number 7, verse number 15. John seven fifteen. The Jews marvel, saying... How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? Well, here's one thing they said. How did he know letters? In other words, he knows letters. In plain words, this is not psychobabble. You remember what they called the Apostle Paul in Athens, Greece? They called him a babbler. <coughs> That's what they called him. The, the Stoics and the Epicureans and the rest of the philosophers of Greek wisdom and culture when the Apostle Paul was telling them about the unknown God, they said, you're a babbler. The term comes from little birds that come down and peck up little, little uh, seeds and so forth around and are indiscriminate in what they, what they eat. Uh, like, a, Have you ever heard the term peck with a chicken? You ever, you ever, you ever watch what a barnyard chicken will eat? Uh, <laughs> how many ever been around chickens and stuff like that? I, when I was a kid, I was around. I loved people in our family, part, members of my family, had, uh, had farms and so forth. And I'd visit with them. Although I was raised in the city, I'd go out and I'd watch them uh, uh, as, they, uh, as they cook on a... How many's ever eaten uh, biscuits that are baked on a wood-burning stove? The old-fashioned. Build a fire in it and you've got an oven. Good biscuits. I had an aunt down in Riceville, Tennessee. She was, she was a great aunt. She was my grandfather's sister. And man, she could cook. And everything she cooked, it was on a wood-burning stove. I watched her put wood in there and build that fire up. You know, that's, uh, uh, that's, that's just part of life. And I'm, I'm thankful for the experience that I had. You, uh, you have a lot of people that if you don't have a degree next to your name... They won't listen to you. There are churches out there that say, if you don't have a PhD or a THD or something next to your name, you're not qualified to be our pastor. You see, that's sad. What, what qualifies a man to be a pastor, preacher? A call from God. That's what qualifies him. A call from God. And I'm afraid that we, that we get away from that. Uh, I forget who it was, but one of the old-fashioned, old revivalists, uh, uh, evangelist years ago said, he said, he said, you give me the men that are from the, behind a plow. 
You take that man out of the field where he's plowing and you take that man out of the shop where he's, where he's repairing and you take him away from the job site where he's building and, and you put a Bible in his hands and get him on his knees and get him right with God and you get a call of God on his life. He said, that's where your power is going to come from. That's where it'll come from. Did you know that most young men that are born again, if they're really born again, they believe the Bible naturally? They do. You have a natural inclination to believe the scriptures. You have to go to a Bible college and be taught out of believing the Bible. You do. You do. And it happens. Jack Chick had an excellent track on that one time years ago. Talking about some man got saved, some young man got saved. He went off to a Bible college somewhere. Professor gets up and starts tearing his Bible apart. And the young man lost it in the track. He lost it jumped up and I mean he turned on God and turned on Christ and turned on the school because his whole foundation had been destroyed right before his very eyes and went right back into the world. That's sad. That happens. That happens. I pray that your faith in the scripture is never questioned when you come to Temple Baptist Church. Let me tell you something folks. Please hear me and I'll just condense it as quickly as I can and get a short come to the chase as fast as I can. Don't let anybody ever flim flam you to make you think that they can go back to the original Greek and, and change this book you've got in your hand right here. The original Greek does not exist. Period. It does not exist. And you've got a book right here. When somebody begins to assault your Bible, you say to them, what is your authority for, assault, for assaulting my Bible? If you're telling me my Bible's got all kinds of errors and mistranslations, what's your authority for that? Of course, they'll run back to the Alexandrian text and this and that and so forth. And we got all that stuff. I got all that stuff. God had had it for years. And I still believe this book. Amen. 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 That's why when you get up and preach it, you can take a hold of it and you can say, thus saith the Lord. Amen. You know, you don't get up and say, well, maybe God said it. Until we find something better, this is the way we ought to live. <laughs> no, thus saith the Lord. Amen. Got a book I believe. Amen. <laughs> As one man said, it's a, the old King James double barrel, 12 gauge right here. <laughs> King James Bible. And it does make a difference. But how does this man know letters having never learned? You had Hillel and Shammai. These are the two schools of Judaism at the time of Christ. Hillel was a little more liberal than Shammai. And Gamaliel was of the school of Hillel. So when the apostle Paul grew, when he, when he was, grew up, he grew up under the teaching of Gamaliel or Gamaliel or however they want to pronounce it. I, I usually say Gamaliel. And he grew up under that. He was a Jewish sage. He was a teacher of the law. And uh, the apostle Paul was educated in that. The apostle Peter was a fisherman. See the difference? Peter was a commercial fisherman. Paul was trained. He was trained also in the Greek culture because he lived in the Decapolis. He lived, he, he, was, he was fully, uh, was fully exposed to all of that of his day and probably the Lord chose him for that reason because he had a strong Jewish foundation but he also had a strong uh, a Greek foundation. Paul was a Roman citizen. See, he was a, a cosmopolitan type Jew. And so with all that knowledge he had, he began to write scripture and show the fallacy of all of it compared with the direct revelation from God. And that's the difference, folks. It's not a bunch of, uh, a bunch of uh, nuances and abstract ideas. It is a direct revelation from God, the book. So how does this man have letters having never learned? How does he know all of this? Because he wrote the book, that's why. Amen. Luke chapter number 22, verse 27. For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat, but I am among you as he that serveth. Made himself of no reputation, the Bible says. Took upon himself the form of a servant. He said, I am here as a servant. The, <coughs> the Greek word uh, doulos 
means slave or servant. The Greek word diakonon, which we get our English word deacon, is akin to that. It's one who serves. That's what the word means. The Lord Jesus Christ was the servant of the Lord. We read about him in Isaiah chapter number, uh, chapter number 52, 42 rather. He was the servant of the Lord. He came to serve. The Bible said the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was He didn't come to be saved. <laughs> he came to save, to give his life for us. So if you'll be ministered to, serve. If you want to do something about your attitude, begin to serve. Amen. Give of yourself to someone else. And, not hold, and, and, and instead of trying to take care of yourself all the time, give of yourself to someone. Amen. And boy, do we, do we not have people that need it today. My, I'm among him, among he that serves. Look at John chapter number 1 and verse number 2. John 1, 2. You know, these are practical teachings that I'm, I'm talking about this morning. These are practical things. John 1, 2. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All right? Let me look at my reference here. Let's see here. John 1, 2. He came unto his own. Verse 11. And do what? His own received him not. Now who's his own here? He's not talking about humanity. He's talking about Jews. He came to Ude. Ude Ryan, as Hitler and Rosenberg would say, Juden Ryan, Uda Ryan, Jew free. <laughs> they set about to wipe the Jews from the face of the earth, free of Jews. So what's the problem with America? Jews. Who's running everything? Jews. Who's going to bring on World War III? Jews. The Jews are responsible for the crucifixion. The Jew. Who's to blame for everything? The Jew. Who's the scapegoat? The Jew, according to some. Amen. Amen. I get so tired of hearing that stuff. The Jew gets blamed for everything. Who has more Nobel Prizes than anybody else? The Jew. <laughs> Maybe that has something to do with why they're Amen. mad at the Jew. Maybe it's because they are smart. Alf, what was his name? Einstein? He was a Jew. Oh, yeah. Do you know why God made them so smart? Because they had to survive. They had to survive, folks. The Jews have had to survive. They've been blamed for everything under the sun. How many ever heard of blood libel? You ever heard of blood libel? Few of you have. What's blood libel, preacher? The Jews were accused during the time of the, well, let's just say, for hundreds of years in Europe, during the time of uh, the Dark Ages, of taking children, snatching children away from their parents, taking them out into the woods, Bleeding their blood, sacrificing their blood, taking their blood, draining their blood, mixing it with matzahs or stuff like that and eating it. That's blood libel. They accuse the Jews of that. How many ever heard the Pied Piper of Hamblin? Little fairy tale? The Pied Piper? You know how the Pied Piper goes? It's a play on a, on a, on a, on a truth that, that I just gave you. Well, let, me, let me show you how it goes, all right? These towns overrun with rats. All right, they got all these rats. They can't get rid of the rats. So this fellow comes in and he says, I'll get rid of your rats, but you're going to have to pay me. All right, we'll pay you anything to get rid of these rats. So he goes through the town and he plays his flute, and all the rats in the town follow him out of the town, right? Rats are gone. He comes back to the elders of the town, time to pay me. See the money involved in it? We're not going to pay you. Rats are gone. We don't have the money. I'm sorry. So he takes his flute. He plays his flute. And all the children follow him out of town. All the children follow him out of town. The rats are gone, but now their kids are gone. Their future's gone. Their posterity's gone. It's all gone. All right, look at the parallel with blood libel. See? He takes money. He takes their children. And so this message goes from one place to the next. Although he's not mentioned, everybody knows who they're talking about. See what I'm saying? You get the same thing today. That's part of culture. You understand 
that you, on the surface you can only use certain words, terminology, say certain things, but underlying or underneath that, everybody knows what they're talking about. So that's what's going on. Blood, the Jew gets blamed for everything. They blamed him for the crucifixion of Christ. But who nailed him to the cross? Who drove the nails in his hands? The Romans did. Who sent him into this world to die for your sins? The Father did. What was he dying for on the cross? Whose sins? Our sins, right? Everybody was involved in the death of Christ. Amen. Yes, they were. Everyone. So he came into his own. His own received him not. That's so sad. He came to the Jew and the Jew received him not. Now, don't you think about it for a minute. You know, we have people who become missionaries that go to the mission field. I have great respect for missionaries, always have, and always will, because you have to have a call to be a missionary. Yes, sir. You do. When Tommy Tillman sleeps up underneath the bridge with, with, with lepers, he eats with lepers. Would you do that? It's not, that's not easy, folks. That's a call from God. Okay. Now, the Jew seems to be the odd man out. What about the Jew? What happens to the Jew? Where's the Jew going? I remember an interview on YouTube. I won't say who it was, but the fellow being interviewed is well known throughout this country. Well known. And immediately they brought up the Jew. What's going to happen to the Jew, they said to him. And, of course, he looked back at him and said, well, he's going to hell. He's going to hell. And that, I mean, they came after him, bang, bang, from both sides. <coughs> and he thinks he knows the Bible. Have you ever really read Romans chapter number 11? Have you really ever really read it? You read that. I want you to think about something. Let's go back into eternity past. Let's go back to the one who knows all things before it ever happens. Almighty God. If one child, one child was born in, one, in any pagan country on this earth, that one child, care who it is, is born in a pagan country anywhere on this earth, lives out their life, and never hears the gospel of Christ. Think about it for a minute. Who knew that would happen? God knows it'll happen. Amen. And see, here's the problem in the church. Here's the problem. Well, I got saved. Now, I know I haven't lived for the Lord, but I got saved 35 years ago. And during that 35 year period of time, you've been in, you've been out, you've been in, you've been out. You've been in, you've been out. You backslid, you got right. You backslid, you got right. You backslid, you got right. You're up, you're down. You're up, you're down. You're up, you're down. That's the human experience. But I'm going to heaven. It's quiet in here. Why are you going to heaven? Because you prayed the sinner's prayer 35 years ago? The only way you can go to heaven is to be born of the Spirit of God. You must be born again. John chapter number 9 says plainly, If you had not seen the light or known the light, or been exposed to the light, then you would not be held accountable for the light. But now you say you see, yet you've rejected the light. Therefore your damnation remaineth. You're judged by the light you accept or reject. You're going to be judged by the life you live, dear friends. You're going to be judged. Are you telling me I can be saved but I'm judged by the way I lived whether I go to heaven or not? I'm telling you that if you've truly been born of the Spirit of God, it's going to change the way you live your life. This is why the Lord Jesus said, Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. We got a crowd out here today. They're on, they're on YouTube, they're on TV, all over the country. They're up telling people, listen, repentance is a work. They're saying, repentance is a work. You don't need to repent. All you got to do is believe. And once you've believed, you're a child of God from then on. 
Notice the way people are living today who just believe. You ever noticed? You ever watched them? You ever, you, you ever watched the direction America is headed? And they believe. You go out here and ask most people on the street, do you believe in God? Yes, sir. 79, 80% of the people in America believe in God. A good 60, 70% say they're Christians. Yet they accept sodomy. They accept, they accept lesbians. They, many of them accept abortion. And yet they believe. They believe. See, they, they, they believe. God's a good God. He's going to say, we'll find out if you believe. How do you do that? If you're not willing to repent, you never believed. When you repent, your life will change. Your life doesn't change. You haven't repented. You haven't repented because you never had saving faith. Once you have saving faith, that changes your heart. You're going to repent, and that's just the start of your repentance. You're going to repent the rest of you. You're going to become a real repenter. You're going to do some heavy-duty repenting. Because God doesn't hit you with it all at one time. 20 or 30 years down the road, he may start bringing things up that you have had long since forgotten about. And Satan may bring it up and begin to beat you to death with it. And that's when you say, Lord God, that's not who I am anymore. That's not me. And such were some of you. And then you'll confess it, repent of it, turn from it, rebuke it. Say, that's not who I am. You see what I'm saying? I'm talking about the real Christian life. That's the real Christian life. And, but the, we, we, we've, got, uh, we've got an awful lot of people. A lot of people, they, the Baptists, when I first got saved and got into the Baptist church, a lot of good things about the Baptists, but there's some things about the Baptists that aren't so good. That backsliding is one of them. But when I first got into the Baptist church, well, this bunch of Episcopalians over here and, and these Methodists over here and these Presbyterians over here and this crowd and this crowd and this crowd, this crowd. If you get around the wrong crowd, they're going to condemn everything under the sun because it's all about stuff and about people. Folks, there are saved people out here in all these places, most of them. And if they ever get, if they, if a lot of these places, when they start growing, they'll get out of them. They start walking with the Lord. They'll get out of these places. The Holy Ghost will lead them out of it. But uh, you, uh, you have to understand the Bible says God blinded them that he might have mercy on them. When you talk to a Jew today about the gospel of Christ, he'll be polite. He may listen to what you have to say, and then he'll turn you off just like that. Why? Because he'll appeal to his Talmud and to his teaching. That is what is blinding them. And they'll turn you off and turn away from you. Did you know a Muslim and a Jew, you take a Muslim and a Jew and stand them side by side, you look at what a Muslim believes and what a Jew believes, and you'll find yourself, if you do any studying, you'll find yourself far closer to that Jew than you will that Muslim. You certainly will. The point of contention between you and the Jew will be about Christ. It'll be about Christ. But you have the, both of you have the same Bible, the Old Testament, but that Muslim does not. He has rejected it completely. So you think about that. Look over here at Romans 11. Verse 1. Hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. What ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they've digged, they've killed thy prophets, dig down thine altars, I am left alone. And God, what does God say? But what answer the what but what saith the answer of God? I have reserved to, mes, to myself seven thousand men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. All right, that's the remnant saved in every generation. Turn to Revelation. Chapter number 14.
Revelation chapter number 14. Verse 1. I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Sion with him a hundred forty and four thousand, having their father's name written in their foreheads. Who are these hundred and forty-four thousand? Well, uh, the, the most Protestant churches teach that they are uh, that they're that the church. Go to uh, Revelation seven. Revelation chapter number seven. Verse four. I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred forty and four thousand. Now, is there any way to mix this up? That's, you know, that's, that's, that's not an arbitrary number. 12 times 12 is 144,000, right? 12 times 12 is 144. 12,000 times 12,000, 144,000. All right, you've got the 12 tribes of Israel. How do I know that? Look at verse number four. I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed in 140 and 4,000 of all the who? All right, now let's stop for just a moment. Are we talking about real Jews or are we talking about spiritual Jews? Are we talking about the Israel of God or are we talking about real Jews? All right. If we're and we are, I mean, I think you know this. Verse 5, of the tribe of Judah, of the tribe of Reuben, of the tribe of Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh. And there's a little difference in here because of, uh, you, have, uh, you have Manasseh and uh, the two sons of Joseph. And uh, the reason for that is because the, the northern uh, tribe had apostatized and, uh, and, and, and they're left out of the list here. But anyway, these are Jews, 12,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel. What are they doing here? They're preaching. When are they preaching? They're preaching in the tribulation period, right? It's called the time of the church's trouble. I'm glad you caught me on that. What's it called? Jacob's. Jacob's trouble. All right, now here's the standard Protestant party line. God is finished with the Jew once and for all and forever. That's it. He's done with them. And all of the promises and scriptures that say Israel literally means the Israel of God or the spiritual Israel. In other words, the church. So they, they excise the Jew... And they put the church in place of the Jew. Now what's wrong with that? There's a problem with that. But now let's push that aside for just a moment. And let's start thinking. Well now wait a minute. Then that means that God's going to use the Jew. There you go. He sure is. Yes he is. Well then that means there, have, there has to be Jews around. That's exactly right. They had to be born somewhere didn't they? These Jews were born of Jews who were born of Jews who were born of Jews who've been around here since the time of Christ, right? Amen. Absolutely. Absolutely. So now, uh, Hal Lindsey wrote a book, The Terminal Generation, wrote that about 30, 40 years ago. Right? And what you've got right here is the terminal generation of Jews as it relates to the second advent of Christ. This is the last generation of Jews as it relates to the second advent of Christ. Well, you say, are these Jews a member of the body of Christ? No. Body of Christ left in chapter number four. Church is gone. Who are they? They are 12,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel right here on this earth. What are they doing? They are evangelizing the earth. What do you mean? They are preaching the gospel. What are they preaching? They're preaching the everlasting gospel. You mean there's a different gospel? Well, the Apostle Paul took his gospel and compared it to what they were preaching in Rome, not Rome, but Jerusalem, and he called it my gospel. And he said, I went down there and I compared what I was preaching lest I had run in vain. In other words, I'm working against them. We need to have some unity and conformity here with what we're doing. But what Paul was preaching is what God told him when he took him off into Arabia and he gave him the gospel of the grace of God. This is why he chose the biggest part of the New Testament written by Paul because of the gospel Paul was preaching. 
What is the, gospel, what is the everlasting gospel in, in Revelation? What does it say? What's it say? A little. Do what now? That's right. All right. Now go back to the book of Ecclesiastes. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Written by Solomon. I hadn't planned on going this way, but here I am. I'm going to wind up doing stuff. Ecclesiastes, chapter number 12. Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, verse 13. All right, now this is a, this is a, this is a, this is a summation. Well, I've run out of time. I swear it's 15 minutes till. I didn't realize. Well, let's just read this before we go. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Now watch this. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. All right. Is there anything wrong with that? Not for the time. There's nothing wrong with that. But there's nothing in there about the grace of God. And Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures. Why? He hadn't died for your sins according to the scriptures. And they were living under an Old Testament economy. So what happens? What happens is very simple. When the Jew once again comes to prominence, 12,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel, they preach the everlasting gospel, which is closely akin to this gospel right here in Ecclesiastes. You know why? Because they're not preaching that gospel to build the church of God. They're preaching that gospel to bring in Elijah and Moses. There's a reason for that gospel. They're preparing the world to receive the two witnesses. Yes, sir. And when those two witnesses show up, they'll show up just like they did in the Old Testament. And we'll get into that later. Unless Brother Crane dismisses, please.